panel is organized in partnership with United Nations Development Program, UNDP. Dear participants, welcome to the 10th Belgrade Security Forum. Our next panel is starting now. Hello, hello everybody and uh, welcome to this uh, Belgrade Security Forum uh, session on uh, exploring the uneasy relationship between uh, uh, technology, trust and legitimacy. Um, trust, as uh, we all know, is the basis uh, around uh, all our relations revolve and evolve. Uh, but trust is fragile and uh, many private companies and governments uh, that were supposed to act as uh, trustees of society um, have demonstrated that uh, they're exploiting technologies uh, uh, for their narrow political or uh, uh, economic interests. So in this session, uh, we'll try to find out who can we actually trust today in this uh, chaotic global network uh, world that we live in today, faced with all kinds of threats and trust eroding phenomena, from data and privacy abuses, uh, to information operations disrupting elections and uh, political processes, to spreading false information and conspiracy theories in the, constant, in, in the context of the global, global pandemic. So uh, today I'm joined uh, virtually, unfortunately, with a great lineup of speakers, so I'd like to introduce them now. Um, the first one is uh, Mr. Jovan Kurbalia. Uh, he's the director of uh, Diplo Foundation based in Geneva. And uh, he was also co-heading secretariat of the UN Secretary General's uh, high-level panel on digital cooperation. Uh, uh, next to uh, uh, Jovan is Ms. Uh, Ninian Pevgen, uh, Managing Director of the Swiss Digital Initiative. Uh, then uh, Mr. Hannes uh, Grassiger, uh, journalist and economist who, whose reporting focuses on uh, the network technology and uh, the changes uh, uh, that these technologies introduce into the world that we live. He also um, was one of the first uh, journalists to explore uh, the scandal uh, related to Cambridge Analytica, so we'll be hearing uh, from Hannes later. Um, and uh, Ms. Maria Gavrilov, uh, who runs uh, uh, business operations of the Exponential View and uh, produces its podcast that is dedicated to understanding the present uh, from a multidisciplinary perspective of economics, technology, uh, philosophy, and business in order to explain the future. Uh, so welcome all, uh, but before we uh, dive into this session, I'd like to uh, say a few words about the structure of today's session. Uh, we'll have uh, three interactive uh, uh, parts, uh, each uh, 15 minutes long approximately, and in the first part we'll uh, explore how we got here, uh, how we got in this situation, what uh, uh, are the main uh, forces that are shaping this field, and uh, what chain events uh, you would uh, uh, single out as the most important. Uh, then in the next, uh, in the second part, we'll uh, try to um, uh, learn how we can cope with this situation, how we can, you know, as practically as possible, navigate this uh, confusing uh, digital world that we live in, who we can trust, what practical tools we can, uh, we can use to, 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 to uh, uh, navigate this and uh, that are at our disposal that you're working on. And in the final part, um, we'll see what lies ahead of us, uh, how the situation is likely to um, evolve in the future, um, but also um, is it possible at all to return humanity and trust back into the focus of uh, technology development. Um, so, uh, let's get going with the first part, and I'd like to ask uh, Jovan to kickstart the discussion and uh, give us uh, your take on, uh, on, on how we actually got here, you know, what is the current moment in time that uh, we are living. So, Jovan, yeah, please. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you, Slovo. Uh, it's really great to be today with uh, such an interesting and diverse uh, panel. Uh, I would... Uh, uh, start with one uh, one provocative statement we uh, speak a lot about the lack of trust but uh, and many surveys are showing that there is a sort of a, a depletion in trust capacity but uh, our actions are showing something different 
we don't see a reduction in the use of, let's say, Facebook. Um, there was a minor drop after Cambridge Analytica or any of the, to of the tools and companies that are very often in the center of trust-related discussion. There is, there is a paradox uh, when it comes to trust, paradox between what we are discussing and this event or similar events and what we are doing in real life. Now, one, today's situation is slightly different because of a uh, necessity. We don't have that many options. We have to use the tools that are around. But the uh, reality is uh, trust story is much more complex. And I think that we should reflect today on the, this counterintuitive elements. That's the first point that I would like to propose to for today's discussion, this paradox in, in trust, paradox between narrative that we can read, that we can discuss, and reality of, uh, well, now 3 billion citizens worldwide, which are, for example, using Facebook. The second point is to uh, uh, unpack the concept of trust. Uh, it is one of the most used concept and probably the least under, under, understood in details. Does it refer to trust in technology? More uh, reliability of technology, if we can call it. Trust that my uh, camera will work as it didn't work when we started the session. Uh, is it trust in industry like companies like Facebook, Google, Twitter, and the other who are storing our data or now developing AI-based tools? Is it trust in, uh, in government uh, and public institution that should deliver on the basic social contract? We give them our authority, we vote for them in most countries, we pay taxes. In exchange, they have to provide us security uh, security and re reasonable running society, let's say market economy, uh, functional democracy. Can governments deliver on that basic deal that we have with, uh, with governments? Can they deliver it online? Can I, am based now in Geneva, can I, whom I will, should call or contact if my rights are endangered online or if my security is endangered online? Therefore, there are different aspects of trust and I think the key is to, to unpack these concepts and to see what we are basically talking about. And those would be two propositions uh, for today's discussion, at least from my side, addressing paradox of trust and uh, understanding how we use term trust when it comes to digital technology. Is it trust in technology itself, trust in companies that run technology, or trust in governments that should deliver on basic social contract. Over to you, Slobo. Thank you. Well, I think that, you know, uh, all of these are relevant for us today. I mean, you know, <laughs> you really need trust for, uh, you know, uh, most part of, you know, your functioning in the society, you know, whether uh, in personal relations or, you know, societal or political relations. Uh, but let me hear uh, what uh, uh, Maria has to say about this. What's your angle on this? What do you think it's important and, uh, you know, how we, how we got up to this situation? Hi, Slobo, and thank you, Yalan, for setting us up for a thoughtful discussion. It's a great honor to be here. Um, I would actually like to draw a distinction that was pointed out to me by a dear friend, Robbie Stamp, and that is the distinction between trust and trustworthiness. Trustworthiness exists in time. It is something that we build through our actions and behaviors, whether it's the governments or the companies. And in the last 50 years, that trustworthiness has been eroding uh, continually with maybe even we were blind to it. Um, but now not yet as we have these powerful technologies that sort of bring it uh, forth for us. But with that temporal dimension of trustworthiness, I think it's worthwhile uh, go a bit into history and seeing what happened 50 years ago. So in the 1960s, uh, there were two crucial events that coincided. One was that economists, primarily free market economists, started gaining more leverage in public policy creation. Um, with that came uh, the, this trend that governments gave up on building policies, especially in the US where I'm right now, building policies that um, protect people. Uh, the policies protect companies, the big players, even monopolies. 
so that was one thing that we're, we're sort of the carpet beneath the citizens feet was taken away by this new regime of governance and neoliberal economics and, and uh, political system. And then the second thing that started happening in the 1960s was that we saw a, a rapid development of integrated circuits and microchips the, that uh, spurred the semiconductor industry that powered the IT revolution we're living in right now. Silicon Valley has a, is a big uh, fan of libertarian, uh, libertarian philosophies and free market economics. And so these companies with their knowledge and the skill and how to create technologies that are uh, that can scale uh, that we get addicted to unfortunately that are useful and very convenient for us consumers to connect worldwide uh, to access information goods and services um, they actually tapped into this economic system that was set up for them and and used it to create uh, global monopolies. So now we have Google, Facebook, Amazon um, as as three major monopolies uh, that that rule our lives, unfortunately. And so for me, really, when I talk about technology, I think of it as a tool that was created within the system and we cannot divorce it from the system. So in order to fix trust in technology, we have to tackle the self. And I'll be happy to discuss, um, you know, throughout the session, uh, what I've seen, how, how different players this. Um, but I think this is for me for now. Thank you. Um, Hannes, uh, it seems to me that the, the internet boom in the uh, uh, couple of past de decades, uh, you know, figuratively speaking, uh, overturned all stones. And basically, you know, all that was repressed all these voices or you know ma minority or majority voices that were you know repressed by uh, uh, editorial decisions of the traditional media or you know by using other means just you know uh, emerged from the dark and uh, that we now have to face the consequences of this uh, so of course uh, social media uh, helped all these people like-minded people band together and uh, actually uh, create, uh, uh, you know, polarization uh, uh, that we are also facing today. So um, now in this context, uh, you have uh, uh, both uh, companies and governments uh, running to exploit this, you know, either for, you know, as some say, you know, fun or profit. <laughs> so uh, would you say that uh, this is, you know, how we actually came to this situation? Or you think that, you know, some other factors were in play? And uh, how do you see the situation evolving uh, from your uh, point of view as someone who has been researching uh, uh, Cambridge Analytica and uh, uh, you know, influence operations and social media in the past? Um, you know, I um, thank you so much for having me here. And uh, it's great being with all of you um, in this uh, little panel. So I think we're... Um, we're facing um, a crisis of authority, and um, it's a it's a more general um, thing than um, a crisis of leadership in technology um, or or government. Um, it's it's in general it's authority, and this is based on 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 the um, um, on on people uh, challenging the legitimacy of you know leadership and experts and authority on on mostly every field. We can see it from you know pop music to politics. Um, it's happening everywhere, and so I th I think this is based on you know networked um, technologies have have given you know as you mentioned um, actors uh, you know a a tool to you know connect and to coordinate. And so uh, what we're seeing is, is global coordination of actors. And I think when we started researching um, Cambridge Analytica in, in 2016, it seems like a century ago now, um, it, it, was, um, it was basically about the, um, you know, the potential that um, you could um, gather so much personal data on these um, you know, gray um, markets for personal data and then use this to kind of like uh, micro target political messaging to individuals during a campaign and 
that that um entire investigation you know it's it's sort of like it's sort of like a blueprint for what we're seeing um i think today which is um something that um people in my field would call societal warfare so it's the idea of you know all these um bubbles that um companies like um um Cambridge Analytica try to build for their customers you know opinion bubbles and truth bubbles that these um bubbles uh, start um, infighting so it's sort of an you know um sort of the idea of you know um antifa bubble fighting a right wing um bubble on the net and um the the point we've come to is that um that we um, are actually seeing, um, you know, foreign influence operations using this um, ongoing societal warfare. As you know, you you might have heard about the case of um, the supposedly Iranian um, influence operation, um, where you know voters, democratic voters, um, had been micro-targeted um, with an email, which. Um, was um, sent by the Proud Boys, a, a right-wing movement. So we're actually seeing, you know, the blueprint of Cambridge Analytica's micro-targeting playing out on a, you know, totally decentralized, privatized level these days. And, you know, the U.S. is just an example. We're seeing this in, in many countries. And so I think um, this is, you know, the situation we're in is, is something like the you know, it's something like the mid 16th century. It's the beginning of a an entire reformation of the societal structure, and we're just at the very beginning of it. And and I have a sense that this field is constantly shifting. I mean, as you mentioned, uh, you know, 2016. You know, it feels like it was uh, it it was you know in in the past life. I mean, you know, uh, since then it's it's not been just you know uh, like uh, data mining. You know, we have a. Uh, um, uh, spear phishing attacks. We have uh, um, uh, uh, s uh, very sophisticated manipulation, um, uh, often augmented using AI uh, for generating images, generating video. So you know this. I'm not so much scared about like the latest technologies. I think most attacks, you know, on on our like you know public discourse um, or established truth actually takes place through very, you know, very simple methods, you know, like look at the way the Trump campaign is like slightly modifying videos. This is not a deep fake. This is not, not state of the art technology. Um, I'm, 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 I think the most advanced, you know, um, discussions is, is the sort of like multi mass player online game that we call QAnon, where people like, you know, voluntarily participate in some kind of, you know, challenging, you know, authority by, you know, building up this like incredibly scary looking um, um, broad public international movement. It's just basically a game, I guess, sometimes to like, you know, scare, you know, scare authority, scare the media. And, you know, um, that's far more advanced. I think we're, you know, the entire discussion of digitalization often focuses on technology, but it really is about society and the way society is changing. Thank you. Uh, Niniana, I want to ask you one thing. Uh, uh, you're leading the initiative uh, to establish digital trust label in Switzerland as a part of a digital Swiss initiative. And... Uh, and also work on, you know, embedding the ethical standards in, in, in technology development. So um, uh, we will, of course, uh, talk about it just in a moment. But I wanted to ask you about, uh, you know, the reasons you started this. So, I mean, you, you, you're intervening, you know, in, in this area. But what, you know, prompted you to do this? Was there any particular event or chain of events that, you, that, that prompted you to go in this direction? Thank you, Sloba, and also thank you, Jovan, for putting up this panel. It's a pleasure and an honor to be part of uh, this discussion, even though I'm not uh, in Belgrade, but virtually. So, um, yes, I just want to touch on what um, the other speakers just said. I mean, um, Hanasi was talking about the crisis of authority. I think we, we face several crises, so, of course, a global health crisis and economic crisis, um, but we also face a crisis of trust. So trust towards, uh, so the people don't trust their governments anymore. I mean, in Switzerland, it's probably 
a bit different, but also states don't trust each other anymore. Um, the trust towards our international institutions. And um, last but not least, uh, trust towards new technologies such as AI um, or the big companies. And, of, and as my, 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 this, the other speaker already mentioned, this has to do with a lot of incidents such as the fake news, the unnecessary data collection, um, interference into, into the elections, etc. So it is clear that within, within um, th those circumstances, um, innovation and legislation fall short if, if trust is not guaranteed. And it needs a collective effort to to overcome this this trust gap, I would say. So that's that's why um, uh, that's why the digital trust um, the sorry the Swiss Digital Initiative was actually founded. So one year ago at the Swiss Global Digital Summit in Geneva, and what be became very remarkable. So the the topic of this summit was um digital ethics and fairness and the digital age and what became very very prominent was that like everyone every company every organization from the icrc to the tech companies to the companies um such as the railroad um companies for example in, in switzerland um everyone faces this trust problem and also what we um, what we saw is that there are a lot of principles, there are a lot of values, a lot of was written and thought already about um, how to overcome this um, this trust gap. But the real question is, what can we do? What can we do? How can we come from the principles to action? And that was the background why this was the initiative was founded. We thought we need to do something through very concrete project, and that's what we are trying to do right now in, in Geneva. So great. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, please do continue because we're entering this second part, you know, and I, I'm really curious, you know, what actually are you working on? And I will ask Hannes because he's also working on something concrete. So so let's start with you. I mean, uh, uh, how, how does it work? What are you actually working on? Uh, you mean um, Ninian? Yeah, yeah Ninian. Okay. Yes, yeah, so, so so the digital trust label is actually the first um, project under the umbrella of the Swiss Digital Initiative. We started this project one year ago together with EPFL, one of the leading um, universities here in Switzerland. And the objective was, of this digital trust label is um, it's geared towards the user. So we want to give the users more information, more transparency on what what is behind digital services. So we we started um, one year ago by thinking actually what Joan just mentioned at the beginning. What does digital trust means uh, from a user's perspective? Um, what does digital trust means? And and we came up um, and it's it's as Joan already said it's a very complex notion and it has so much to do with other factors than than. Um, and very different factors. So the context, the relationship with with the company we have. So um, to transfer this already in the digital is a very complex um, challenge. And on the other hand, also to to turn this into the label. And I think the main <clears throat> um, the main important thing is that for the development of the label, what is clear, it needs to be a multi-stakeholder approach. So it needs to take into account the experts' view. So it needs to live up to a certain um, technical standard so that it's um, from an expert point of view, which is from an expert point of view fulfilled. Second, it needs um, to be usable and uh, have a certain value for the users. They need to understand the label and to see a certain um, value in this label. And third, um, it of, of course, it needs also to be implementable in, into the in the, the practice so that uh, companies, but also public organizations can actually use this as a, as a tool to, to further improve their digital tools. So how far have you gone with developing this? Um, so as, as I just mentioned, um, uh, we, we are still a very young initiative and we started in, in January. Um, but for now, we have a first draft of this um, label catalog. We work together with a big um, audit uh, firm, which is uh, SGS in, in Geneva. And to make sure that it's not just 
based on self-assessment, but it's actually verifiable and auditable from a third um, party, from an independent third party. Then now we are in the so-called so code development process. We um, asked more than 100 different organizations and experts from um, civil society, from the academia, but also um, from organizations around the world to give us feedback, to give us input and to help us to further develop this label. So now we have um, a consolidated version of the content and now we are working on how can we communicate it to the user? Should it be in the form of an energy, energy efficiency label, for example? Should it be more like a nutrition fact table? Um, so that's where we stand today. But that, I mean, uh, you know, in this case, you're putting some label on, on products, you know, but, but how you actually go about putting this label, you know, virtually on, 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 on which um, virtual products you put this label on? So um, this this will be, of course, um, the, the big challenge to implement this in, in, into the practice. But um, it, once or in, in our um, imagination, we want to put it um, to digital services to, for example, to, to an app um, that, that helps us, for example, book um, um, a, a travel service, for example, and, and the label um, certifies, verifies that this app um, make sure that certain um, data protection standards, privacy standards are respected, um, that, it, that the user is not manipulated, that your data is not sold to a third um, party, etc. So, so in the end, it should be on, on dig digital websites and apps. Okay, thank you. Uh, Hannes, what are you up to? You're working some, on something with the World Economic Forum, right? I, I, I can't seem to hear you. Thank you, Ninyan. This was fascinating. When are you planning to roll out your trust level, if I may just quickly ask back? Please unmute yourself, Ninyan. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. OK. Um, so, so we are now at a stage at um, where we talk with different partners because we think um, it should not just stay a label for Switzerland but become more an international um, label. So now we are looking um, with partners who could possibly implement us with us uh, because we are still a very small, small organization and we think we strongly believe that actually it should be more an ecosystem. Um, than just one player um, rolling out this label. So we are at the, at the stage um, of looking for partners. And then if everything goes according to plan, we plan to launch it at the second half of next year. Well, yeah, so um, I'm, I'm, I'm working on a, um, I'm working on a um, so-called um, public social network, um, which should be a, a public social network for news, um, so um, the idea being that, um, you know, Switzerland is, is a very small country and um, most of the people get most of the news most of the time through uh, social networks that are basically giant companies run from abroad. And so our information space is basically um, not, you know, managed according to, you know, the rules of the game that we've set on the physical territory. And so um, thinking about this, you know, as a journalist, speaking as a journalist, thinking about this, uh, you know, anti-industry that has evolved over the last years um, of, you know, people fact checking, uh, checking for disinformation. And, you know, it's become an expert field and it's, it's really growing, but the problem is it's just running after the fact. So, um, um, the the um, idea of the public social network would be, um, you know, we have this big discussion about, you know, algorithmic, um, you know, transparency and quality. And we have this big discussion about, you know, content moderation, which is um, the part of a social network um, which uh, decides what you should not see. And so what if you would build a social network that, a doesn't focus on engagement time in the way it's like distributing news. B um, that would have a um, publicly available, um, you know, um, algorithm 
that you can have a look at and that the public can basically decide about um, in in its you know details and um, see if you had a um, you know publicly accountable um, board for you know the censoring um, decisions. So um, the idea is to create a social network where um, first of all news outlets and uh, media producers and journalists can um, you know verify their accounts and this is the what, whatever they put on the network um, or what comes from their domains can be put on those networks so everything you can find on the network is um, basically from a verified source and um, people who would want to put up information on the network would have to um, you know a sign that they basically um, follow the press um, codex and for users, this would mean that you ha would have a um, one-click way of accessing all, you know, the known media um, outlets from left to right, from, you know, most niche to most local to most, you know, mainstream big um, that adhere to the standards of, you know, a, a quality media in the broadest sense. So, um it would basically create a safe um, fact space. And, you know, looking at a, you know, looking at how our realities are like falling apart into these, you know, very atomized, individualized, you know, um, digital spaces. I think um, the, the only way to like con maintain, you know, a democracy will be to, um, you know, create a place where people can actually have access to factual information. And this is what we're uh, starting to lack. And, you know, thanks to Corona, this has become as, you know, it has become an incredible, you know, unraveling of the news sector. If you would like me work in the news sector, if you would see, you know, how, how these, you know, offices are emptying out and like, like, like it's it's incredible so people are actually not aware about how dire the situation is and so this is a way to create kind of a publicly owned infrastructure for people who provide provide factual information uh, you know on one side we're faced with uh, you know these uh, social media giants and uh, you're just you know uh, feel helpless often and you think that you know this is just you know how the things are and uh, we just cannot do anything. But uh, I think that, you know, what you're suggesting is that we should rewrite or, or, or actually recode uh, our online uh, uh, information and social spaces. And, and I think it's possible, actually, uh, despite the fact that you have all these giants around us. Because if, for instance, TikTok is showing us something, is that, you know, the current, the, the today's infrastructure for, you know, building these kind of new services and new interactions is, 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 is really there to enable uh, 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 very quick uh, uh, spreading and very quick adoption on a worldwide level. So, I mean, you know, what, what, what Facebook, you know, it took them years to come to, to the scale of TikTok that, you know, TikTok like uh, reached uh, in a year or so. So, you know, the things are, you know, uh, 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 changing in this area. And, uh, and I think that, you know, you, you, you can basically, it is possible to recode uh, um, you know the, the the social and information uh, spaces that we that we uh, use every day. I actually want to start small. I want to start on a national level. Okay, no problem. Um, uh, uh, Maria uh, and Jovan, uh, please share us some 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 reflections or tips that you have in, in this regard. Maybe maybe one comment just to build uh, what you heard about this excellent initiative on public space. Uh, we recently started the discussion, we call it Meet 2030, it can be called anyway, on a very simple question that uh, public institutions, I would say, I don't know about Swiss Parliament, but I know parliaments worldwide, uh, I know about the UN, are uh, running their meetings on private platforms. Could you imagine that uh, UN meetings, official of security, council is uh, held in the restaurant or in the hotel. And uh, you have use of Zoom, of uh, Tencent application, uh, v uh, WebEx, you name it and you have it. But there is a very sim simple and symbolic, in addition to security aspects, question, why we allow 
that our public meetings of our public institutions, from the UN to national par parliaments to cantonal parliaments, are held uh, online, as it is happening currently. And um, I started the initiative trying to gather the few uh, organizations and um, few friends uh, with whom I'm, I started developing literally open source platform. I think that we as a, as a public, as a programmers, the people of, who have the interest that the public interests are protected can develop open source platform that can be secure, that can be transparent, and that can be used by public institutions. And uh, this is amazing. Uh, I have to admit, I'm shocked that uh, all of these universities, public institutions, are not starting addressing this very basic and symbolic issue. Where do we meet? Do we as a parliament meet in the private hotel? Uh, I've been pushing for it. I can share with uh, with colleagues here and, and participants so far the background document, but we may have the first version on open source platform towards the end of November. Uh, as you know, there are few few platforms like Jitsi that can be used. And, and what is the most paradoxical uh, question here is that it is relatively simple to develop online meeting platform. You have to have a good compression, but you have ease, you have these compression tools from the gaming community. They have excellent compression tools. And you just have to develop this type of interface that we use today with a bit of chat options. And Zoom did it uh, maestrally by making the huge fortune about it. But back to the previous, uh, to, uh, to this question of the Swiss uh, public uh, media platform, we need also to develop the space for public meetings. And that is also a question of building trust. Trust that institutions can, like they build the Swiss parliament or they build the UN, they can build the online space, open source space, which could be a public space. And that's just to add on this, this, uh, this previous comment. Okay, Maria. Yeah, I, I'm afraid this won't be a fun discussion because we all seem to agree quite a bit. Um, but um, I, I do agree with Hannes that this has to start really local within communities. And actually, Slobo, I would like to draw back to your big question um, and, and wrap it up with some examples that I've seen. And that is, can we balance humanity and innovation, modernity and innovation? And I think that we have to. I don't think we really have a choice. Uh, we haven't really mentioned it thus far, but we we are amidst an existential crisis, and that is not the coronavirus, it is the climate crisis that we don't solve in the next, you know, uh, 10 years or start solving it seriously. We will all suffer like we've, you know, it, it, to extreme amounts. Uh, we have about 3000 days until we reach a critical uh, amount of carbon dioxide in the air of particles that will tip us over to the edge where mass migrations, extreme flooding, extreme weather events will become uh, very frequent, even even more so. And we're already seeing it. So, so I think that we have to innovate, get ourselves out of that and is crucial for that as well. Because in order for people to act on on this, they have to communities that they're sharing their environments with. They have to trust the sources of information where they live. Um, they have to trust the governments where they live. I mean, here in the US, you now have uh, a good amount of population that still doesn't believe in climate change because of this information, because of what certain public officials are saying. Um, and, and it is it is a it can end up in a big human catastrophe and environmental catastrophe now i think we have to innovate uh in in two segments one is on social technologies and by that i mean the tools that we use uh to come to a certain consensus to 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 start a discussion amongst ourselves our governments and the organizations um democracy is a technology uh, parliaments are a technology, public spaces can be seen as a form of social technology. Um, and so, so I, I do that we have to reimagine what that looks like, 
how that communication happens, not only how can we trust governments more, but how can governments trust ourselves as citizens of our respective countries. And the other um, segment of innovating is the technology that we know, you know, solar energy for uh, has nothing to do with trust right now, but uh, the problem that I was saying of climate crisis, solar energy is the cheapest energy source in history right now because of technological development and improvements in technology. Um, now, some of the examples that I've seen uh, or heard about uh, in, in the past months tied to two countries that I'm, I've become a big fan of. One is Estonia and the other one is Taiwan. We recently recorded a podcast with the Taiwan minister, and I'll be happy to share it with um, everyone here. But um, Minister Audrey Tang with us, some uh, tool they use to come to a consensus as a society. They crowdsource policy decisions um, on, a plat on an open source platform, which means that all citizens have a right to share, to, to give their vote for how they think a certain matter should be tackled. They use machine learning to build a map of um, where uh, opinions are so that everyone has an idea where the, the rough consensus could lie. So not a complete agreement, but a rough con consensus that can move the conversation forward. They use the open source tools with their citizens to decide how to treat Uber, uh, how to how digital work should be uh, you know, should be paid and how they should work within the digital economy. Um, and, and so I think Taiwan is really a great example to look at um, for these tools. Um, also, they use regulatory sandboxes. Uh, I know that some countries in Europe practice this as well, um, where com certain companies get um, a sort of a free play space to go beyond the laws that would prevent them to, uh, to innovate um, and they give them the space time to build certain new technologies but within a protected space so that no one is harmed before they're tested um, and and before they they go into implementation phase um, so so there are ways um, I think what stop us, stops us and this is maybe something we can discuss in the end is really that we have lost the imagination to see how things can be different. Uh, things have been have, have been operating in a certain way for so long that that people have lost, well, that trust really to reimagine that process. I think that we, it's all well, the things that you're mentioning. I mean, you know, uh, we, we, we have to be constantly reminded that, you know, the internet is not only the technical, but, you know, social infrastructure and that it is the result of, uh, of uh, collaborative work of, you know, many people, corporations, different interests and uh, values encoded in what we use every day and that it can be changed. <laughs> so, you know, uh, uh, it can be changed. You know, we didn't have Facebook or, 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 or you know, we didn't have TikTok, you know, just, you know, five years ago, Facebook 10 years ago or 12 years ago. So, I mean, you know, things do change and can change. So I think uh, it's really important to always remember that and, uh, and, and, and face this crisis head on. I mean, you know, um, as, 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 as I mentioned previously, you know, the, the internet put us all in constant touch. And this is a fundamentally new situation. We will be facing this situation for the decades to come. And I mean, it's, it's not a, a, a thing that can be easily solved by, you know, a single government or whoever. So, so we need this imagination experimentation and we have to believe that, you know, the things can change. What do you think, Hannes? Just please unmute <laughs> first, <laughs> sorry. Um, thank you so much, Mariah, for pointing out, um, you know, how relevant having a, you know, having a functioning um, media system can be for, you know, navigating um, challenges such as climate change, which is the ultimate challenge, um, of course. Um, I, I love the idea, you know, how Jovan, um, how Jovan spoke about, like, building these, you know, meeting spaces. So I, I think we're, we're very much at the beginning of building, you know, we haven't yet even started collectively building um, 
the 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 public in itself so we haven't built the places the squares the meeting spaces we haven't built you know the fact space that i'm interested in or you know the 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 ways on how to verify you know market interactions as ninian is working on with her trust project and you know i i'm i'm an economist myself you know and i i was raised on a steady diet of hernando de soto researching how much trust impacts on you know um economic growth mechanisms and how much people would be better off if they had more trust in certain systems so i i think we're in a pretty um exciting moment rather i think we're actually in a moment where we're starting to realize that facebook is basically probably just a very ancient you know it's a pyramid it's run by one person and after the pyramids there came you know cities and and you know networks and and you know we are about to build this okay ninian what do you say uh you know how how this is going to evolve you know where do you see us in a in a, in a couple of years or decades if we if we survive of course <laughs> all this mess <laughs> So, so I mean, as Maria changed, I really liked her statement that we need again new imagination. I mean, our, our world is changing and changing rapidly, and um, I think everything is is what was pointed out points towards the same or towards the same ob objective. We need more accountability. We need more transparency. And um, we need also more participation. And pr with participation, we mean also that. When people participate, and we see that especially um, in Switzerland, um, Swiss people vote every three months on uh, very important political decisions um, and, and can really influence the policy making process. So people have a, a, a huge understanding in general of the political processes around um, the decision making processes. And I think it's the same if we can foster more understanding of um to to take take on the the people on, on this on this journey and not just um uh, seeing as technology as a tool but really asking what does it mean for us as people for us as a society how we communicate how we how we interact with each other what does that do to us um when when we when we achieve um to, to, to bring or take the people what if I think um, we can already win a lot and and so for that I think um, especially in Switzerland we need um, to have uh, more debate on, on those questions and second um, I think Switzerland is, is really placed um, or has a, is a good place to start um, talking about um, the, the question of, of how can we foster trust how can we foster participation um, especially in, in international Geneva, the heart of international diplomacy, um, where also now Jovan is. Um, it, it's, it's really at the place where we, where we need to collaborate more, to participate more, and, and to foster this dialogue, actually. Thank you. And, and this leads me to, to actually uh, uh, Jovan, because uh, uh, it's really fitting that you mentioned Ninian uh, uh, Switzerland and, uh, and, and your tradition of you know, dialogue and, uh, and everything uh, related uh, to this. I want to ask Jovan, because uh, it's, it's not only Switzerland, of course, it's, uh, it's the other uh, you know, major forces, political forces in the world. We have a, we have a, uh, I would say, uh, currently uh, at play um, uh, a clash of approaches, if you will. Uh, on on one side, you have uh, you know the the, the rising uh, tech power of China uh, in both tech and political uh, sense as well. Um, you have the the, the U.S. approach. To to technology governance and basically uh, the, the internet and uh, the, the that we have today came from this uh, um, ecosystem and of course European Union and Europe Europe is also a, a big player in this field uh, so do you see these uh, different approaches to technology governance uh, converging in the future or, or significantly diverging uh, and uh, what is perhaps you know the role is there a role or uh, of, the, of the United Nations in all of this, you know, whether 
I wonder, you know, returning to the basics, you know, the basic uh, values uh, uh, that UN is is really uh, upholding, like you know, the the human rights, the sustainability development goals, is 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 a part of the answer to this. Uh, Slobo, one reflection, and let me be a bit controversial here because Maria called that uh, we should bring some controversy, is uh, related to Geneva and one of the important social dialogue and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who wrote the social contract, he was from Geneva. Uh, we are living now uh, something which I sometimes call autoimmune disease of enlightenment. Enlightenment was based in its uh, simplification on two pillars, on modernity, science, human rationality, efficiency, and humanity. And we have for the first time, and these two pillars were working for two or three centuries relatively fine. We are now uh, seeing the encryption of the efficiency and modernity over humanity. Through AI, through reduction of choices to the control, you have many examples. Now in Geneva, throughout the history, you had uh, obviously strong focus on efficiency through the uh, Calvin's uh, movement, Protestant movements and, uh, and religion, but you had also always balancing act, a balancing act in terms of Red Cross, in terms of international organizations. When you analyze international organizations in radius of three kilometers where I'm staying now, most of them were established in order to deal with the impact of technology of society labor, WMO, where we are based, World Meteorological Organization. Therefore, that dialogue is crucial. How we reconcile modernity and efficiency with core humanity. For that dialogue, Geneva is an important place, not only on day-to-day -day negotiation on e-commerce or digital health, but also re revisiting this deeper social contract that we will have to redraft, not to be signed on dotted line, but we have to draft the draft a share understanding what we expect from the future. Now, UN is uh, basically in extremely uh, delicate moment. Uh, the question of digitalization and digital agenda at the UN is not just the question of another issue that UN has to deal with. I would say this is the will be ultimate test of uh, future and survival of the UN as a uh, impactful and the place where the future discussion on on the future of humanity can be held. Uh, Secretary General established the UN High Level Panel led by Jackman and uh, Melinda Gates, and he gave us quite open mandate to think about this social contract in inverted commas. My experience from that exercise, I, I, I was executive director of Secretariat for one year, is that uh, uh, there is a clear understanding in the top echelons of many organizations, but the system itself is driven by inertia. And that inertia is very powerful. Therefore, I, am, um, I have a mix of, let's say, I'm, I'm sort of optimist by, by default, if you can call it, but there are serious questions how to reboot the system, how to stop it, do we need major crises? Obviously, COVID is a, is a big alarm, but I'm not sure that it is on the level to to reboot the system. Uh, that's that's the key questions. Revisiting social contract around uh, dealing with this autoimmune disease, hopefully not of enlightenment. Having important discussion in places like Geneva, which has history of discussing that interplay between efficiency and humanity, and seeing how the UN can can step in in that and. Uh, find a new uh, raison d'etre, new space, building on the, what you mentioned, the slob on the question of peace and security, uh, development, and protection of human rights and human dignity. Those three pillars remain, I would say, relevant also for digital era. Over. Uh, Hannes, uh, any closing thoughts? <laughs> What do you think mm. it's, 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 you know, key takeaway for the future? I, I think, I think that it's, it's, it's just the very beginning of, of building, um, you know, and that's, that's, that remains to be seen if we can be quick enough, um, 
because I actually think we're in the crisis that is is um, that is strong enough to cause actual harm, and so we have to you know build the ship whilst on on the ocean. Ninian, what would you say? What's important for our survival? <laughs> Please unmute. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Again. Um, very interesting analogy. So I think there are different paths, um, uh, as already outlined by my um, co-speakers, and I think one another path actually was. Um, uh, mentioned by Mariette Schalke in the MIT Technology Review, where she um, called um, for a democratic um, alliance um, of, of different democracies um, in the in the digital space, and to to move forward, actually, that the governments um, take a more important role. So I think this is also a, a very interesting path path that should be followed. And then, of course, the question is also how can we bring um, how can we create this accountability um, this um, uh, understanding also for, for the digital space and how can we um, yeah how, how can we know where, where to call if a cyber incident is for example happening um, what what to do um, to, to understand better and for that I, I think um, as we already talked before we need a debate we need the dialogue and we need to continue this dialogue but um, on, on the other hand we also need concrete actions and I think um, of course um, it's probably um, initiatives such as the digital trust label are just um, small small efforts that are just one building block in, in creating this digital trust however I believe that we need to start somewhere we need to learn along the way and we need to adjust um, but but to, to go really into action and, and try out new things and try to recreate um, yeah this this, uh, this, this uh, space and um, um, even though it's not it's not it's not a Swiss quality, but even though if we would fail, but I think important is to do something and take initiative. Thank you, uh, uh, Maria. I, I I you know I, I wanted to ask you you know to tell something you know optimistic, but and because I thought that <laughs> for the end because I thought that you know this this session is actually I mean we're dealing with extremely complex issues and extremely grim. <laughs> you know the situation is not fun. So I thought that you know we're gonna end up on a on a on a really bad note, but I mean it's it's not like that. I mean I feel a, a great deal of optimism uh, throughout the session. So uh, I'm not gonna ask you, you know to give us something optimistic, but just you know uh, what do you think uh, would be the most appropriate takeaways? Well, the Pandora's box is open. So what we have left is really, really hope, and knowing that there are people in the world like. Um, you know, people on this panel who are thinking about these things and doing things uh, to move us to a better place. Um, I think that a new social contract has to start from um, ability and, and holding accountable players who have done injustice, whether it's Facebook or oil companies. And then we need to build uh, mechanisms of responsibility. Where does responsibility lie in this new world? Um, who decides uh, on what is good for humans, uh, especially, uh, you know, with, with, with the growing power of AI. Um, on a brighter note, I do, I urge everyone to tap into uh, economist Kate Rayworth, uh, reimagination of, of economy, uh, which has human values and human value well-being at its core and she is already doing uh implementing her framework um in in communities and cities around the world so that people like kate are, are really giving me hope that things can change things can change um and that we can uh, really move this, what we call system System, which seems so huge and amorphous and ambiguous that we can move it into the direction where it works for all of us. 
Thank you very much for this. Uh, and and uh, it's been really an amazing session. I mean, we, we heard so much optimism, you know, that, and I think that this has to be a takeaway from all of this, that, that you know, uh, th th there is a light, you know, and th th we can change things. And uh, I mean, you know, the problems are huge, um, but you know, the possibilities are huge as well. And uh, we can uh, affect this change rather quickly now that we are, you know, connected with all these scalable infrastructures. So uh, I like, uh, you know, to ask, um, <laughs> yeah, our mileage may vary. I, I, I saw that, Johan. Um, uh, I like to, to call for, uh, for, for a virtual round of applause <laughs> for, for, uh, for, for our uh, great lineup of, uh, of uh, session participants and uh, to, to thank, of course, uh, all people uh, who've been with us uh, for this past hour and uh, to tell the Belgrade Bel Security Forum for hosting us here. So until next year. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching the online panel of the 10th Belgrade Security Forum. We will be back soon.